I applaud all the widowed mothers who used that pain for fuel for the journey. I applaud the mothers who didn't allow abortion to be an option, but rather trusted God despite the chaos and the confusion. You are the true heroes. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. We wanted to express our uh, token of appreciation with these small gifts and flowers in these bags. Let me get this uh, mic stand going. There we go. We wanted to express our gratitude uh, to all the mothers with the small gift and token of our appreciation. I pray you uh, feel encouraged today, inspired today, loved today because you are special. Very special. Tell your Bibles in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Mothers are powerful. Mothers are passionate. Mothers are protective. Protectors of one of the most sacred places known to man. The home. The home. A mother's influence is of the most precious time in a human's life. Their childhood. Their childhood. Satan is trying to get our children. They're trying to go after their childhood. As we know in the Bible, it says in John 10, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. He came to steal the identity of our little children. By having passive fathers in the home and reactive mothers in the home, switching the roles where the women lead and the men submit. And the children are thinking, if I, I'm a boy, should I be like daddy who submits? Or should I find my identity through the scriptures? Satan is trying to kill the innocence in our little children. Pedophile is being called and relabeled as minor attracted persons. Where men and women are debating that we should give leniency to men and women attracted to minors. We're in our schools. LGBT is being preached as truth and facts. When a man should not change his biology to realize his fantasy, but change his fantasy to make sure he's living in truth, reality. Sending comes to destroy our joy. There's no joy in the households nowadays. Rather, it's a stain for apathy, insecurity, anxiety, and anger. Thank God for our godly mothers. Warriors protecting the home, protecting the innocence, the identity, and the joy of our children. You know, there's a story of a boy born in 1908 to a 24-year-old mom named Nancy Hanks. At the age of nine, the boy suffers a devastating blow as his mother, Nancy, passes away. At the age of 19, he suffers another devastating blow as his dear sister passes away during childbirth. At the age of 23, he begins his political career and runs for local office, and instead of getting victory, he gets defeat. Two years after the age of 25, he runs for local office again, and this time he gets elected, amen? Age of 26, he gets engaged to who he calls his sweetheart. In the summer of that same year, his sweetheart, sweetheart falls ill and she dies. Some historians believe this led to his nervous breakdown in the following year. In 28, by 28, he uh, joined the, the Illinois bar and began to practice law. By the age of 30, he runs for Speaker of the House of Representatives, but again, he gets defeated. At 35, he runs again and he gets defeated. At 38, he runs again and he gets elected. At age 40, he gets rejected for the position of commissioner of the general land office. I love how this guy was always going on different routes. By the age of 47, he sought the nomination for vice, principal, vice president of the United States, but the nomination went to someone else and he didn't receive it. On the 6th of November, 1860, at the age of 51, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States of America. Abraham Lincoln, arguably one of the greatest presidents America's ever seen. 
is noted to say this. I've learned from my mother that when you have a dream, you have to chase it with determination and courage. He also says, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to my life all my lifetime. He also says, all that I am, all I hope to be, I owe it to my angel mother. What kept this guy from going from failure to failure, from defeat to defeat, from setback to setback, from death upon death in his household? The prayers and words of his mother. Don't you underestimate the impact and influence of a godly mother. The impact and influence of a godly mother. At the very beginning, when the Lord was creating the heavens and the earth, he created the sun, the stars, the moon, the animals, but the crescendo of his creation was Eve, the mother of all that was living. After Eve sins, the Lord sets in motion a plan of redemption for the fallen world. His solution is Jesus, his method, virgin birth. The Lord could have just had Jesus appear at 30 years old and begin preaching. But the Lord saw fit to bring Jesus in the world through motherhood. In the same way Timothy learned from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice how to have faith. And how King Lemuel in Proverbs 31, mother, we're going to be learning from some some mothers today in the Bible. The title of my sermon this morning, very simple sermon, is Great Lessons from Mothers in the Bible. Great Lessons from Mothers. And I I pray the brothers can learn from women today. This morning, in honor of Mother's Day, let's look at a few mothers in the Bible. What I've come to realize is there's a lot about motherhood that cross sections into discipleship. As Aaron Barshall powerfully shared, hopeful endurance, motherhood, discipleship, joy in the midst of affliction, motherhood, discipleship, unwavering devotion, motherhood, discipleship. In Matthew chapter 1, we find the lineage of Jesus from Abraham to Jesus. Now, what's quite fascinating is within the lineage, we find five women listed. For those who know genealogies, you understand that women don't often make the cut. (laughs) But what's so powerful is that the Holy Spirit wants us to understand, no, no, I'm I'm writing these women in here for a very specific reason. And as we read the text, you know, you may be surprised at what women we see. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's the first woman. Perez the father of Hezron. Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadab. Aminadab the father of Neshon. Neshon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz. He was the mother of Rahab, second woman. Boaz the father of Oded whose mother was Ruth, the third woman. Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, fourth woman. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa. If we jump down to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the fifth woman, of whom was born Jesus, who's called Christ. These five women don't strike us as godly. For those who know who Tamar is, for those who don't, she was widowed twice. Now the Bible says both her husbands were wicked, so God had to step in and take them out. But she was widowed twice, and she kind of manipulated her father-in-law to sleep with her to have a child. Rahab, a prostitute, labeled as a prostitute all throughout the Bible. It doesn't change. From Old Testament and New Testament, Rahab, the prostitute. She was a Gentile. Ruth, 
another widow. And the Bible says she was a Moabite. In Genesis 19, we find where the Moabites come from. Lot's daughters get Lot drunk, and they sleep with him. Incest. And we get the Ammonites, ben Amin, and the Moabites. Uriah's wife. The Bible doesn't even call her Bathsheba. Now, the first time Bathsheba is introduced in the Bible, she's introduced as an adulteress. And then we have Mary, a poor teenage virgin girl. Jesus' genealogy was filled with broken people who had broken stories. Like I said before, Jesus could have just poof. I'm 30 years old, let me preach the word. But he chose to identify with these women. You know, the number five represents God's grace. Number five represents God's grace. And I can't help but believe that our God is able to turn darkness into light. He's able to turn a mess into a message. A test into a testimony. Pain into praise. Trauma into triumph. Tell your Bible, this is Genesis 16. You guys love your members? Yeah. No one can replace mom. In Genesis 16, we, we find our first woman we're going to study out today. And her name is Hagar. Her name is Hagar. Point one, Hagar, great submission. In verse one, now Sarai... Abraham's wife had borne him no children. So she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having kids, children, sorry. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years. Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise, to look down on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abraham, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. Didn't you, didn't you, didn't you, con- is this not, are you not the victim of your own design here? I put my servant in your arms and now that she knows she's pregnant, she dece- despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that was beside the road of Shur. This is on her way to Egypt. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I want to away for my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel answered, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Then the Lord also said to her, you are now a child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your misery. He'll be like a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Point one, Hagar, great submission. Sarah gets impatient. Ever been impatient before? She gets impatient, decides to take matters into her own hands. What does she do? She gives her maidservant, Hagar, to Abraham as a proxy wife. Impatience is a sign of faithlessness. It's it's a sign of, 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 not that you you don't see the promise, no, you acknowledge the promise. You just don't believe God's going to fulfill the promise. And Sarah was impatient. Now, Hagar can see that her attitude towards Sarah changes. She gets, uh, you know, a little bit too, too, too big for her boots here. She gets treated so bad she runs away and finds herself in the desert. Ever been in the desert before? Maybe some of us are in the desert right now. Now, she ran away from her situation because it was difficult. But the question God asks her is quite profound. He asked her two questions. Question one, where have you come from? Ponder for that question for a moment. In the text, 
the angel already knows where she came from. Right? If you read, it says in verse 8, Hi, guys, Sarah's servant of Sarai. The angel already knew. And so was he asking for information? He was asking for confession. You know, sometimes God asks us questions in the Bible, not because he doesn't know where you're at. You, you've got to kind of know where you're at. You know, sometimes you're out of touch. You're, you're living in Disneyland spiritually. You think you're one thing, then after you realize, man, I'm really, you have your quiet time, I'm, I'm a completely different thing. You see, God's tender love here. Hagar has nothing to do with the story of salvation. But God still goes to her in the desert in hopes to bring her back to be with his people. Where are you coming from? It's a question we must meditate on today. Do you remember where you came from? You remember your life post discipleship? You remember the emptiness? You remember crying yourself to sleep? Thoughts of suicide? You're not super depressed, but you're not super. There's a, a meh. It's a lethargic response to life. An inability to want to change the pornography, the masturbation, the hardness of heart, the insecurity, the apathy, the desire to want to do great things, but not feeling you can do it. Do you remember that? Yeah. I don't think you do. Do you remember those times, church? Yeah. God is calling you to ask and ask you where you came from. Yeah. And not only until you answer that question can you answer the next question. Where are you going? Yeah. You find that the angel of the Lord didn't allow her to answer the second question? Because he already had in mind where he wanted her to go. Yeah. In verse 7, it says that she was in the desert on the road of shore. This is the, the way back to Egypt. She's going back to the world. The difficult situation in the kingdom with God's people was a bit too much and overbearing for her. That she responded like Sarai. Gets impatient and wants to go home. Now in verse 9, what does the Lord call her to do? Go back and submit to your difficult situation. And she does. I mean, if I'm in her shoes, I'm like, come again? <laughs> and she submits. Why did she submit? Because God saw her. God saw her. You know those times where you don't feel God's seeing you? Those times where you feel God's abandoned you? Those times where you feel God's not there anymore? So sometimes you're asking, why, God, why are you allowing me to go through this situation? Why am I still learning this lesson again and again? Those times when you're working super hard and no one recognizes you. Those times when you feel you should be fruitful by now because you've been giving your heart, but no one sees it. No pets on the back. No amens. No names mentioned in the sermon. God sees you. God sees you. And she saw God. Great submission goes from challenging and unbearable. To willful and second nature, only when you begin to see God. When you begin to see God. God is working in our lives right now, church. God's working in your life. When things seem like they're falling apart, they're simply falling in place. If things don't look good right now, God's not done. Because the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And have been called according to his purpose. Do you believe God sees you? The question is, do you see God? When I think about mothers, I think about great submission. A great submission to, okay, nine months right now with this baby here. A great submission to, okay, when the baby cries, I got to attend. A great submission to, okay, this is going to be life for the next three years, I guess. A great submission to the lot and portion God's given you. Mothers are the greatest heroes known to man. Because they raise great men and women who go and do great things and change the world. You've got to fight to see God. It's not easy. 
Any mother will tell you that. But it's necessary. The question comes, how do I see God? Matthew 5 verse 8 says, blessing the pure in heart, for they'll see God. How's the purity of your heart this morning? Any bitterness? Criticality? Anyone you have, a, have an issue with in your heart right now? Any unforgiveness? Any pornography? Any masturbation? You may be in this room right now, but not see God through this lesson. Because of the impurity in your heart. Now the question comes, okay, how do I purify my heart? 1 Peter 1 verse 22 says through obedience. Obedience purifies our heart. That we can love sincerely from our hearts. Identify the areas in your life today where you're disobedient, where there's a lack of submission. We learned last week, surrender and submission are two different things. Surrender is where you don't have a choice. Submission is when you do, but you still say, Jesus, Lord, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Where's your lack of submission today? Imitate our godly mothers and embrace great submission. First Samuel chapter 1. I'm assuming you guys are silent because you're enjoying the sermon. Amen. Anybody heard about hysterical, hysterical strength? Those times where, you know, maybe a baby goes underneath a car and the mom's like... And lifts the car, grabs the baby, and everyone's like, what is going on here, right? It's when you get an extra dose of strength to do the impossible because there's a life and death situation going on. There's a desperate situation going on. There's something that desperation taps into within the soul of every man. There's something that desperation does to you that no other motivation can do. Not even inspiration. There's something about desperation that's so key and crucial when it comes to motherhood and discipleship. In Genesis 6, Noah was called to build an ark. He was told it's going to be flooded the entire world. Now, Noah had never seen a boat before, never seen rain. Called to do the impossible. And yet, he still trusted God. And when the desperate situation came, only eight people were saved. The Bible says the road is narrow. Are you on it? If only eight people were saved in Noah's time. And during that time, they're giving away people in marriage, people being married, people eating food, having feasts. How many are saved today? Are you surprised that only a few are saved? Desperate situation. Judges 7, Gideon, by direction from God. Called to will his men now to 300. Amongst a mess, not knowing how many there are, countless. 300 versus countless men, ruthless, trained from birth to kill. And 300 men. Now I'll give Gideon some slack here. I understand why Gideon was a little bit afraid. But God placed him in that situation. God placed him in that situation. Because God knew that Gideon had to be desperate to get the victory. And he does. And they succeed. First Samuel 17, you know the story of David and Goliath. Can you imagine? Nobody in your city believes that God can take out Goliath apart from you. Nobody. Just you. And you're not afraid. You're not scared. You're not anxious. You're ticked. You are mad because you know the God you serve. And God doesn't only put David in that situation. David walks into that situation willingly because he knew God will give him victory. The Bible reveals time after time God places men in desperate situations to get the best out of them. Are you desperate this morning? Desperate for your relationship with God. Desperate to grow. Desperate to become a disciple. Desperate to change. In First Samuel chapter 1, it says in verse 1, There's a certain man from Rephaim, a Ziphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroboam, son of Elu, and the son of Tuhu, the son of Zeph and Ephraimite. He had two wives. That's the first problem. 
One was called Hannah, the other was called Penina. Penina had children. She was a mom. Hannah had none. She was not a mom. Year after year, this man went up from this town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord, almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the law. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he gave portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. You know how challenging it is to accept that the Lord has closed your womb? Not like, oh, I've got medical challenges. No, no, the Lord has saw fit for me in this moment to be barren. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Oh, can her husband would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Kind of out of touch there. Once when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bareness of soul, Hannah wept much, prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow. That's the process of healing. Weep, pray, make a vow. Oh, Lord Almighty, if you only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying the Lord to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her, heart was, her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 62, verse 8, we've got to pour out our hearts to God. The Bible says it looks like you're insane. 16. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked, asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no downcast. Early next morning they rose and worshipped before the Lord and they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because I asked the Lord for him. Point two, Hannah, great desperation. Hannah, great desperation. You know, God placed Hannah in a, in a desperate situation. I believe the Lord closed her womb. Why? To produce a hunger in her to be fruitful. God was trying to whet her appetite. Get her hungry. I believe the issue in the world today is people aren't hungry. I think people are hungry for food. You, you see that all around the world. But people aren't hungry for greatness. People aren't hungry to honor God. Even disciples. The Bible says selfish ambition is sin. But so is no ambition. An ambitionless disciple is not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, guys, you 12 evangelize the world, deuces. <laughs> Jesus placed these men in desperate situations. Put great pressure on them because he expected greatness from them. Who are we to reinterpret in discipleship? How hungry are you to be fruitful? How hungry are you to change? How hungry are you to grow? Does it bother you when you see men and women who have sadness in their eyes? Walk in the streets day in and day out. Does it not bother you when you sit on the train and you see men and women aimlessly, devoid of spirit, going to work in a job they don't love, to go on vacation where they're going to get mad and discouraged, to come back home to do the same thing again and again? If that does not produce a hunger in you, I don't know what will. And God was designed to produce a hunger in Hannah. 
Can you imagine that year after year being provoked? You knowing that I'm going to this place and I know that this woman over here is going to irritate me till I cry. And every year you became a victim of it until this one year. Every year you sat in that discouragement and that persecution. But today you decided to stand up. The Bible says she stood up and she went to the temple. She wept. She prayed. And she made a vow. You know, mothers are always praying for their kids. When kids raise and get old and they, they leave the home, the, the sad reality is that sometimes kids have to go into the darkness. And in those moments, mothers cry great tears for their kids. Your mothers probably cry great tears for you. And in those times where your mom is helpless and she can't do anything about the situation, she makes a vow. Many of us may be here today because of that vow. I'm thinking about my mom. The most consistent woman I know. Consistent, reliable. Whenever I needed anything, she's always there. Always there. My mom's my superhero. Now, there's one time my mom beat me. <laughs> only one, it only had to happen once. <laughs> only one time. I'll tell you the story another time. <laughs> but my mom's love has made me the man I am today. Now, we, we understand that as Eli is watching Hannah pour her heart out to God in this desperate situation, he thinks she's drunk. Sometimes desperate people look very desperate. Insight. No, desperate people are desperate. You know you're desperate if you look desperate. You know you're desperate if you look desperate. How do your prayers look? I think one part of our prayer life that we've got to go after groaning is, is a portion that I call begging. The Bible says in, in Philippians uh, uh, chapter 4 that prayer is one portion of our prayer life, the conversation part. But then you have the thanksgiving part, the gratitude part. But then you have petitions, begging. Do you beg God in your praise? Like beg him. Someone who only beg God when he understands, man, I can't move this situation in my own strength. I've begged God for some of you in this room. And it's worked. And I know that you've begged God for me. <laughs> and I'm standing here, it's worked. Amen. But pouring out your soul, being in that desperate situation, you look desperate and you do desperate things. Now, Hannah's great desperation produced great sacrifice. She gave her son back to God. I believe God put her in that desperate situation so that she can have a desire so much for the blessing that her heart shifted somewhere down the line where it was more focused on the blessor. That the blessing was easy to give. The Bible says that God remembered her. Was that not the subject of her prayer? God remembered the misery of your servants. And God remembers her. And then she remembers him again and gives Samuel to God. What does God do after that? He remembers her again. It's a game of remembrance right here. Wow. In chapter 2, it says this. Wow. In chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord was gracious towards Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. You know, great desperation produces great sacrifice. And God remembers sacrifice. You know, God's love language is obedience. But I think his heart language is sacrifice. He sacrificed himself for us. And when I think about the cross, it makes me emotional. Because I think we don't think sometimes about God and him. He's experiencing his feelings during the, the cross. God had to kill his son. 
Can you imagine killing your child? He had to turn his face from his son in the time his son needed him the most. I believe God's heart language is sacrifice. And this birthed a revival in Israel they've never seen before. Samuel became a prophet who produced companies of prophets. He went to, to anoint the greatest known Israel, Israelite king, David. And the Bible says that Samuel was a great man of prayer. The power of great desperation and great sacrifice we find in the great mother, Hannah. I applaud all the single moms who have to make men ends meet. I applaud all the widowed mothers who use that pain for fuel for the journey. I applaud the mothers who didn't allow abortion to be an option, but rather trusted God despite the chaos and the confusion. You are the true heroes. When I think about great sacrifice, I can't help but think about Carol Hurdy. Carol Hurdy was a woman of great sacrifice. She uh, cooked hot meals for Sean and MJ every Sunday during MJ's second pregnancy. She never complained despite her illness. She smiled despite the pain. But though sickness was attacking her body, she didn't allow it to attack her spirit. She said, focus on God even though her health was declining. Her strength was declining. There was a time where she was unable to walk, but still she was given over to a walk with God. And now she's with the Lord in heaven and waiting for us to join her. Amen. That's a true hero. I truly do believe that there's many links between motherhood and discipleship. I only have time to show you these two. But I do believe that today the call is for us to give ourselves to having great submission in areas of resistance in our life. Identify them today. Maybe you're wrestling with being a disciple. Even though it's, it's not about clarity, it's clear that you need to become one. But you are too afraid of the implications of the truth to your family and everyone else around you. Trust God and have great submission. For some of us, we have to have great desperation in our lives. Who are you going to baptize next week? Who are you going to help see their need for God next week? Who on your phone do you need to call tonight after this service that you know need what you have? And for other of us, we have to have great sacrifice. I believe if we embrace all these things, God will move in a radical way. I love you. And to God be the glory. We love you, we love you.